Okay, welcome to another episode of the Freedom to Draw Unsolved Mysteries. I'm your host, John. Today we have the case Don Henry and Kevin Ives, two unexplained deaths that happened back in 1987. And as always, if you have any information on this case, you can contact these places right here. Jot it down. Whatever you got to do, remember it. Now let's get into the case of Don Henry and Kevin Ives. Real names were Larry Kevin Ives and Donald George Henry. Nicknames were Kevin and Don. Location, Alexander, Arkansas. The date was August 23rd, 1987. We're going to tell you about their case as we draw them. In the pre-dawn hours of August 23rd, 1987, a 75-car, 6,000-ton cargo train made its regular night run to Little Rock, Arkansas. The train was over a mile long and was traveling at a speed of 52 miles per hour. So far, the run had been clear sailing as engineer Stephen Schroyer approached the small town of Bryant. Arkansas. Suddenly, while going through the town of Alexander, he saw something in his path. He could not tell what it was as the train drew closer. He saw something in his path. As the train drew closer, he made the horrifying discovery that two boys were lying motionless across the railroad tracks. He placed the train into an emergency stop. Position and lay down on the horn. However, he was unable to stop it in time. Within about three seconds, he hit the boys. Stephen noted that although three seconds does not seem like a long amount of time, it felt like an eternity for him. The weight of the heavy cargo train carried it for a full half mile. The boys' bodies were terribly mangled. <laughs> now the mystery here in this case is why were these two boys laying on a train track? And this does remind me of the case of fast forward the 2015 the case of Tiffany Valente that is on this show you can look her up it's eerily similar uh, is there a serial offender that's going around small towns doing this stuff or was it just a very sad coincidence that's the mystery here folks these kids were high school students and the other girl that was hit by a train in Cape May. She was just out of high school, I think, getting ready to go to college. Kind of strange. 
but they did not happen anywhere near each other. But there was a long time, time difference too. The two boys were identified as 16 year old Don Henry and 17 year old Kevin Ives. They were best friends and popular seniors at Bryant High School. It seemed difficult to believe that they were, they would have laid down on tracks without moving a muscle. With a huge weight of a freight train was hurling towards them, blaring its horn. The state medical examiner, Dr. Fami Malik, said they had been under the influence of marijuana, ruled the deaths accidental. Their parents could not accept that ruling. They began a crusade to find out what really happened and salvage the reputation of their sons. Now, that's the same thing that happened in the Valente case. The parents were not satisfied as uh, it was deemed a suicide. This was deemed accidental. But it is not. It, it is an unexplained death. That's why it's on here. We would not be doing this if it was clear cut. There is a big time element of a mystery to this case. Kevin's father, Larry, could not believe that his son was knocked out on a marijuana or into any other kind of heavy drugs. He was usually present when Kevin returned home from school and his mother, Linda, was always home at nights. Neither had they ever seen Kevin spaced out nor any signs that he was into drugs. By all accounts, Kevin and Don were typical teenage boys who both loved to work on their cars and hunt. Don was a natural comedian, and Kevin was his best audience. So I don't even know where the marijuana hole theory came into this thing. Seems like a mystery. On most weekends, the two double dated. However, on that night of Saturday, August 22nd, 1987, Kevin and Don met as a group of friends on the outskirts of Little Rock at their favorite gathering place for all the local teenagers. The two left around midnight to go back to Don's house. Kevin waited on the porch while Don went inside to talk to his father, Curtis. Curtis recalls that Don came into his bedroom at around 12.15 a.m. He said that he and Kevin were going out hunting. He took Curtis's spotlight and took his own 22 rifle. They talked for about 15 minutes before he left. Kevin and Don set off to go spot, spotting, spotlighting, a form of night hunting which is illegal in camp. Arkansas but plenty of people do it people do it where I'm from too it's called spotting one of them would shine a light in the animal's eyes transfixing the prey while the other fired spotlighting was a fairly widespread activity among the local boys Kevin and Don had avoided being caught that night, they chose their usual hunting ground along the railroad tracks that ran behind Don's house. By then, it was almost 1 a.m. Curtis was not worried about them going into the woods because he did not think 
they would get in any trouble. Well, he was wrong, wasn't he? Three hours later, Stephen Troyer's locomotive train came speeding down Bryant Hill when they were about six poles away from Kevin and Don. And his conductor yelled out a big O oh, and immediately realized that there were bodies on the tracks. It probably wasn't O, oh, it was probably Oh shit. To him, it looked like they had been laid out by somebody. They were lying exactly across the tracks. Their legs were across the rails. Their torsos were between the tracks and their arms were straight down by their sides. They were partially covered by a light green tarp. Lying parallel to both of them was Don's 22 rifle. Neither of them were moving. When Stephen laid down on the diesel horn, he got... No reaction from them. The train then went over them. What had caused Kevin and Don to lie side by side on the railroad tracks? The state medical examiner, Dr. Malik, concluded that they had smoked the equivalent of 20 marijuana cigarettes. He determined that they had been in a deep sleep induced by the psychedelic effects of the drug and had never heard the oncoming train he ruled their deaths an accident. Their parents would not accept Dr. Malik's conclusion. Linda wondered if they were that stone, how were they able to lie down in identical positions? That was her immediate re reaction to the ruling. Curtis had the train's sound checked and found that it was 98 decibels, which is the equivalent to the sound of a jackhammer or air compressor running. He does not believe that anyone could sleep through that kind of noise. He also points out that Don's gun was laying on the gravel. He does not believe Don would do that because he would not want the wood getting scratched. Kevin and Don's families hired private investigators to try to figure out what happened to them. However, he repeatedly received resistance from authorities who seemed unwilling to cooperate. To change their opinions about that case. As a result, the families were not able to move forward with their own investigation. Five months after the deaths, Kevin and Don's parents had a press conference. They hoped to force the authorities to reopen the investigation. The plan worked. The day after the conference, the investigation was officially reopened. It seemed like everything was pretty much staged for it to be like them just getting high and getting wasted. Things were perfectly aligned and let's just face it, that doesn't happen when you're getting stoned. You're not neat and tidy when you're getting stoned. So yes, I agree with the parents thinking that they did not want this to be the explanation. Seems like there was something much more to this case. And this was Kevin Ives I'm drawing here. He probably was the comedian. I'm just guessing here. But strikes me as a comedian. Newly appointed prosecutor 
Richard Garrett and Kevin and Don's bodies had Kevin and Don's bodies exhumed for a second autopsy to be performed by a noted expert. This doctor concluded that together they, they had smoked not 20, but between one and three marijuana cigarettes. Friends who were with them that night confirmed this amount. He also found evidence to indicate that one of them was already dead and one unconscious when the train hit them. Furthermore, he found evidence that Dr. Malik did not follow proper procedures when conducting the autopsy. Other medical experts and researchers stated that it was highly unlikely, if not impossible, for a person to pass out from smoking marijuana. It seemed especially unlikely that it would happen to two people at the same time. In July 88, a grand jury reversed Dr. Mallet's original finding of the accidental death and officially ruled the, their deaths possible homicides. Garrett then focused on the green tarp. Neither Kevin or Don owned such a green tarp. Who had covered them with it and why? All four of the people on the train who were able to observe the scene prior to the accident stated that the bodies were partially covered by green tarps. Police who searched the scene later denied that Stephen had told them about the tarp. According to Stephen, they questioned the existence of the tarp. He felt that was like questioning the existence of the bodies on the tracks. He was certain that the tarp was there. Garrett also believes that the tarp existed. However, it was never found. <laughs> Small town boys go hunting and are run over by railroad by a railroad oncoming locomotive. Does it make sense? I could see them smoking a little bit, giving in to peer pressure, even though they didn't normally do that. That's a possibility. That's probable. The ensuing investigation unearthed an intriguing lead. One week before Kevin and Don were killed, a man wearing military fatigues had spotted it, been spotted in the vicinity. His behavior had aroused suspicion. When police officer Danny Allen stopped to question him, the man opened fire. By the time Allen got up from his seat, the man was gone. Five minutes later, Saline County officers showed up. They searched the area but were unable to find that man. On the night Kevin and Don died, witnesses again reported seeing a man in military fatigues. This time he was leaving town, headed down a road less than 200 yards from the spot where the bodies were run over. Police had been unable to loc locate the man in the fatigues. Six weeks after the investigation was reopened, Garrett came up with strangely similar case in Hodgson, Oklahoma, just 200 miles west of Little Rock. Two young men, Billy Hanline and Dennis Decker, lying together on the railroad tracks, had been run over by a locomotive in 1984. They were lying motionless on the tracks in the position nearly identical to Kevin and Don's. Garrett believes that Kevin and Don were murdered. He believes the assailant incapacitated one of them and then felt like they had to do something to the other one to cover their tracks. They laid down them down on the railroad tracks and covered them up with a tarp. He is not sure why someone would do that. However, prior to working this case, Garrett never carried a gun. However, since he started working on it, he has carried one. He feels that it is his life could be in danger. Kevin and Don's parents 
are determined to continue working on and investigating this case until it is solved. They have spent many hours at the spot where they were killed, wondering how it could have happened. They believe that Kevin and Don walked up on something that they were not supposed to see. They were at the wrong place at the wrong time. They definitely have a suspect there, the military man and the fatigues. This could be some nut just going from town to town, little towns, walking railroad tracks, dressed in military fatigue, perhaps. He had seen action and he went crazy in one of the wars. This man has still never been caught, though. That's not normal behavior to open fire on somebody that's asking you a question, so. I believe the military fatigue man had a lot to do with this case. But the other case in 2015 had no uh, military man in it. So, guys, the suspects were the military man. So, in 1988, someone came forward and said they saw a local man claiming on that night of the murder. He saw two police officers beating two boys senseless in a store parking lot before tossing them in the police car and driving away. The officers later returned to the scene without the boys. It is not known if those boys were Kevin and Don. So, that's a little update on that case, uh, That makes it even more mysterious, guys. This is the case of Don Henry and Kevin Ives. This is the freedom to draw unsolved mysteries, guys. This case is still unsolved. And like we said before, guys, if you have any information, please contact these places. This is a cold case and an unexplained death. True believers, peace out.